The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Do you know who you are? You are a wonder. And when you grow up, can you harm someone that is like you, a wonder? No, we must work hard to make the world worthy of its children. This is Herbert Seguenza. Hi, I'm Herbert Seguenza. I'm an actor, playwright, director. I'm currently artist in residence or playwright in residence at the San Diego Repertory Theater. I'm also the co-founder of the performance group Culture Clash, which was founded in San Francisco in 1984, so we're now in our 33rd year. And I'm Patrick Coleman, and this is Into the Impossible from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. So let's set the stage. Herbert is playing Picasso, not young Picasso, later in life Picasso, in 1957. And he's, well, he's... He's in his bathtub. And, as I'm sure Picasso was prone to doing, he's monologuing about life and art and wonders. And that's our topic for this episode. Wonder in our minds, in our place in the universe, and how to make the world worthy of its children. And who's a better guide to kick this off than quite possibly the greatest artist of the 20th century? Everything is a miracle. It's a miracle that one does not dissolve in one's bathwater like a cube of sugar. One ought to try everything, embrace everything, open the whole world to one's understanding. The artist is a receptacle for emotions that come from everywhere. The sky, the earth, a spider's fragile web, an oven mitt. Each second, each moment in the universe is a unique moment in the universe. But what do we teach our children? That two and two make four, that Paris is the capital of France? When will we also teach them what they are? I say to them, do you know who you are? You are a wonder. And when you grow up, can you harm someone that is like you, a wonder? No. We must work hard to make the world worthy of its children. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. My mother used to tell me, Pablito, if you become a soldier, you'll become a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up a pope. But instead, I became a painter. But I wound up Picasso. Isn't that great? It's the opening monologue from Herbert's one-man play, A Weekend with Picasso, in which he played the artist. And as a painter himself, Herbert, that is, um, he was actually painting on stage while he performed the role. But I'm interested in this question. In, in, in what way are we all wonders? In what ways can we harness the power of the imagination to make the world worthy of its children? We can all probably agree that Picasso was a pretty wonderful guy, even if he maybe wasn't always wonderful to be around. But is that the takeaway, that we should all become Picassos? That would lead to a world that, well, it'd be exciting to live in, I imagine, but probably not very stable in the long run. When people invoke the word imagination, I think it's often linked to wonder, to this idea that Our imagination is an unlimited, boundless capacity, completely free and able to find the universe in a grain of sand or profundity in the walls of a dental office. But when Brian Keating, UC San Diego astrophysicist and associate director of the Clark Center, got talking with Herbert, they started to get at something I find really fascinating, that there are different kinds of wonder, different kinds of imagination and different ways in which that imagination can interact with the stuff of the world, people, history, art, and scientific knowledge. It's a little bit of a battle of the wonders. Picasso's idea of wonder in one corner, and in the other, the kind of wonder advocated by the great physicist Richard Feynman. 
what Picasso was talking about that to him everything was a miracle everything's mm-hmm. a wonder but he didn't want to bother to analyze it or like, like a scientist or or mm-hmm. figure it out you mm-hmm. know he just kind of like a child he mm-hmm. was just letting the world bathe upon him and he would react to it mm-hmm. you know and i kind of that's kind of how i live my life i mean i don't like to be ignorant but in a, in a way i do you it's know a ch- in, in a way i like to like be it's people uh, childlike be curious mm-hmm. and just childlike and like you know i don't understand the, you know the stars mm-hmm. i don't understand that but i just let it but i let it amaze me yeah. you know I've been listening to a lot of uh, very erudite uh, philosophers and mathematicians and, 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 and reading their works. And um, it's interesting because there'll be a, a dichotomy between, say, an atheist scientist versus maybe a, a, a non-atheist or believing non-scientist mm-hmm. and how they approach this, this notion of what is the meaning of life. I think mm-hmm. everybody's asking that. And the lens through which you, you, know, you interpret or capture that meaning – will depend on on your makeup and you came into the world this way i came into the world the way i am and picasso yeah, i came really into believe the, that yeah um and so it's uh, we and, and we should and, and and i always feel like you shouldn't try to make you know try to teach a bee to spin a web right i mean it's not what it's made to do so Mm-mm. so use its strengths you know build on its strengths and that's why i feel like in the creative process of of the scientific endeavor uh, Richard Feynman said, you know, Walt Whitman originally said, you know, if you bring the night to numbers, you know, he was very poetic and he felt like it was bad to be so quantitative about things that are intrinsically beautiful, like a rainbow or the st- how the stars shine. And they didn't know exactly how they shine, you know, the 1850s. Right. But, um, but Feynman said, you know, cannot a scientist appreciate it if he knows this is coming about through a process of nuclear reactions or, mm. or, 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 or atmospheric refractions in the case of a rainbow. Um, maybe in contrast, it can make him appreciate things more. This is a way of getting at one of the questions the Clark Center is working to find answers to. We're looking at imagination on a whole scale of levels, from the individual neuron to neuronal clusters, out to how cognitive behaviors, social interactions, and cultural experiences shape our imaginative capacities. And that goes for how our imagination shapes our understanding of the past, more on that in particular at the end of this episode, as much as it does on what we do a minute from now or next week or where we as a species will end up in a hundred years or a thousand. Imagination shapes our experience on a personal level, but also on the local, global, and cosmic levels. By better understanding imagination, we can find better ways to foster it and to augment and enhance it. You know, we, we call it, you know, inventing the future. You know, how do you, how do you use the, the three-pound supercomputer between your ears, and, and how do you do things? And are there commonalities between what I do as a scientist mm-hmm. and what you do as an artist? And whatever creativity, and there are many, many creative people um, overtly and, and maybe more introvertedly in the sciences and physics, um, but there, there, there seems to be a creative commonality um, in that uh, the the process that we call creativity, thinking of mm-hmm. something that's never been done before, mm-hmm. that attribute is, I think, in common. Whether it's with a paintbrush or uh, as you do it on a stage, like you so, said, I yeah. think inventing the future. I think we both deal with the abstract, mm-hmm. with the unknown, and just by the uh, process of doing, starting that first, you know, that first step. Um, like Picasso says, he doesn't he he doesn't he doesn't know what he's going to paint. Mm-hmm. He, he his, the first brush stroke dictates what the second one will be, <laughs> and and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I imagine that's how sci- scientists explore. They you know they take one step and mm-hmm. see where that leads them, and 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 then you start seeing right. the road ahead of you. Because if you knew what the ending would be, you know it wouldn't be new. And I think right. that's what what we're both doing is trying to do something that humankind has never done before, and that's mm-hmm. that's daunting, but. You know, you don't start off with that. While coming at the question of wonder and imagination from two seemingly different sides, one a bit more wide-eyed and the other a bit more tempered by scientific understanding, there's a lot of common ground in the imaginative processes across disciplines. Yet there are differences. Here, Herbert describes even a difference between his engagement with imagination as a painter 
as opposed to when he's writing a play. I'm also a painter, and mm -hmm. and I feel that painting and playwriting are yeah, playwriting are, are are different. I use different sides of my brain or creativity. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, the the painting process to me is a little more unknown, and uh, and see what happens, and then but playwriting, I feel like I need it. I have to accumulate a lot of of, of data or at least a lot of uh, ideas before I spill it on the page. So I'm, I'm not, a, I don't write every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like I write every day, you right. know, pages. It's like it it, it it will take months or two months of, of, of just accumulating feelings and thoughts and, you know, um, and then then it all comes out and then I'll, I'll write like a first draft mm -hmm. in a night, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just, it just all comes yeah. out. Right. But I don't know what you inspiration. Know, the, right. What, yeah. I don't know where that, where that energy comes from. I don't know. It's, it's, it just all comes out. And then, and then you read it the next day and you yeah. realize it's not good. <laughs> but, I, but at least again, uh, it goes back to that process. It goes back to, you made that first step, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. even if it's no good, there's something there that will, will inform you to keep going. In the case of A Weekend with Picasso, that creative genesis spanned 40 years from the time Herbert was a child. I was born, I really feel this, I was born to play that role. It was like, it was set, <laughs> it was made for me, you know, he was he existed so I could do him. And I'll tell you, it goes way back, I was seven years old, and I, I, I already, I was born with the gift of, of, of drawing and, and I was already, you know, pretty good mm -hmm. as a kid. And I was at a dental office when I was seven and I saw a book by Douglas Duncan. He's a photographer who had total access to Picasso. Mm -hmm. And he, he had a photo book called The Private Life of Pablo Picasso. And I was seven years old and I picked it up and I saw this old man, mm -hmm. Picasso, with no shirt, <laughs> hanging around in his you know boxers, <laughs> painting like a kid. He had kids, he had goats, he had dogs. Right, huge camp. And I just said, wow, this is an, this is an amazing man. I, when I grow up, I want to be this guy. I told my mom and she says, no, he's, he's Picasso, he's crazy. You know, look at him, look at, he can't paint, you know. And, but that, that book had such an impact on me, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that someone could be so free mm -hmm. and so free to do, you know, to be an artist mm -hmm. 24 seven, you yeah. know, obsessive, all, yeah. obsessive, yeah, mm -hmm. where, where art was his life, you know, mm -hmm. and there was nothing else, you know, and, and, and his family, his family was art. Everything was art. Mm -hmm. Everything's a miracle, like he mm -hmm. said. And, um. And, and so even though I went into acting, years of culture clash, in the back of my mind, I said, I've always wanted to portray that, that Picasso mm -hmm. at, at that period of his life. And it wasn't until I turned 50 that I, I started writing a, a Weekend with Pablo Picasso based off that book that I saw when I was seven years old. So um, it, take, it took me my whole life you know, mm -hmm. to get there. The span of a lifetime can seem massive to a person. Probably more massive when you're a kid and smaller and smaller and smaller the older you get, unfortunately. But if a lifetime is a hard thing to fathom, it's no wonder we have so much trouble trying to conceptualize things like the size of the universe and our place in it, and how that in turn might affect how we act. The greatest threat we face is not impact by asteroids, but human stupidity, pure dumbness uh, in so many areas. That's John Lomberg, and he brings us to the second part of the episode, from the wonder of the individual to the wonder of the cosmos, but also a garden and bugs. Bear with us, it'll all make sense. Apart from, from that, I'm generally uh, optimistic and believe, as uh, I learned from Clark and his mentor, Olaf Stapledon, many years ago, that the inevitable destiny of human beings is to somehow become galactic. John is a unique kind of artist. He has devoted his talents to illustrating the discoveries and theoretical ideas of great astrophysicists. If Herbert relies on a certain accumulation of data in his playwriting, John relies on a whole other scale of data, since he's always striving to create the most scientifically accurate visual renderings of his subjects. Among other people, he worked with the late, great Carl Sagan 
on the original Cosmos series. We wanted to have a way of him moving around the universe and the uh, series producer, Adrian Malone, felt it had to be some kind of ship, but Carl specifically didn't want a, uh, a ship that looked like it had a lot of valves and switches, that it was some kind of real ship. He called it a starship of the imagination. And we weren't quite sure what we should make it look like. And this was a painting that I showed Carl, uh, a, a favorite uh, trope of mine, which is making a sort of analog between the biological world and the uh, uh, astronomical world. Uh, stars spreading like seeds of a dandelion. And Carl said, that's exactly, that's what we want our ship to be. And in fact, if you remember Cosmos, there's kind of a running motif through it of a dandelion puffball being blown. And uh, that, that's where it came from. And uh, my job, uh, along with Rick and Don and some other artists, was to create the uh, images of, of space that uh, Carl watched through the window. In addition to this, John is probably most famous for two other projects. One is a painting of the galaxy he did for the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum that was, at the time, considered the most accurate rendering of the galaxy ever done. And the other is designs for the cover of the golden record that went on the Voyager spacecraft. Because of John's work, he has an unusual and beautiful idea of what it means for us to not only be a wonder, but galactic which he shared with us when we convened a symposium with Gregory and James Benford called Starship Century, which featured scientists and science fiction authors speculating on the future of spaceflight. You know, you don't have to go anywhere to be part of the galaxy. We're part of the galaxy right now. The galaxy is here. We're in it. We're part of it. Uh, this, this painting, also from Cosmos, sort of shows the universe at all scales simultaneously because we tend to forget that the realm of the viruses and the atoms and the realm of ordinary life and the realm of the planets and galaxies is one continuous reality. We're, we're the ones that make separations. So for me, the galaxy is kind of the backdrop to, uh, to everything we do. And I think being galactic is as much an attitude. Uh, if we decide that we're a node of galactic civilization, we are. There is galactic civilization, it's us. The rest of the civilization may not know about us and we don't know about them, but if you have the belief that it's there, it kind of changes your perspective on how you look at everything else. Uh, that was a perspective that Carl called the cosmic perspective. And I think that was the continuous thread throughout his entire career, that he wanted to get people to think in terms that the backdrop of things are not the world, not our planet, uh, but the universe. I think we became planetary, as, as Jill Tarter was pointing out, when the Apollo 8 took that picture of the moon rise, of the Earth rise, and we could see the Earth as a planet. That was the moment we became a planetary civilization. And I don't think we're going to have that kind of moment for the galaxy, but I think we can kind of make it ourselves. And if the mountain can't, uh, if Muhammad can't go to the mountain, then the mountain can come to Muhammad. In John's case, though, it isn't a mountain. It's a garden, and it's a garden to help us see the galaxy in a different way. I like to say that we have the anchovy's eye view of the pizza. To an anchovy, the pizza doesn't look round because he's in it. It's just a horizon all around. To get out of the anchovy's point of view, John set about building a map of the galaxy as a garden. It's in Hawaii where I live. In fact, it's right down the street from me. It's the world's first large-scale, explorable model of the Milky Way done uh, as a flower garden. Uh, it's, we've all seen these model solar systems where you have a big ball for the sun and then smaller balls and they're spaced out. And it's a great way for teaching people the geometry of the solar system. Well, nobody had done it for the galaxy. This is still the only one in the world. But my goal was to make as accurate a map of the galaxy as I could so you could get inside it and walk around. I knew it had to be big, and that suggested doing it outside. Doing it outside suggested doing it as a garden. There was another reason for doing it as a garden, which is that I always thought, especially in the colors that uh, nebulae were printed, that nebulae looked like flowers to me. And as I thought about it, 
I realized that in a sense, a flower makes seeds to make more flowers, to make more seeds, to make more flowers, in very much the same way that nebulae create stars, they live their lives, and then one way or another, they return their gas to the galaxy for a new generation of stars. So the galaxy, I'm not saying it's alive, but it has that kind of cycle of, uh, of regeneration. Uh, what I wanted to do was use the same accuracy of mapping that I did with the Milky Way painting at the Air and Space Museum and apply that to the Galaxy Garden. And I asked Leo Blitz, uh, who I'd worked with on that, if he would update his map and, and be my uh, guide on the, uh, on the mapping of the galaxy. And what I wanted to do were find appropriate plants that could represent the various features of the galaxy. The Galaxy Garden project gets really interesting when John starts hitting the nursery. Those of you who listened to our first episode, in which we talked to the poet Ray Armentrout about metaphors of science, will see where this is going. For each feature in the galaxy, John had to pick plants that would represent them. Living floral metaphors, basically. And in fact, we worked out a whole kind of vocabulary of different kinds of uh, flowers and plants representing different features uh, in the galaxy. The gold dust croton, each leaf of which is covered with these little yellow dots, so I, I invited people to uh, imagine them as stars. Uh, another kind of croton, red and black, represented those areas of dust and gas uh, that fill the space between the stars. The hibiscus flowers that represent the nebulae, at least in the region uh, of our part of the galaxy, are planted and numbered to reflect the accurate location of some of the better known, uh, better known nebulae. See, and this fountain represents the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. That's the, the conventional representation of a kind of a gravity well, which flows into a, a, a pool which has a lip, and that's your event horizon. Stay outside and you're fine. Go in and you're, you'll never come out. And then there were the bugs. We needed some people who would volunteer to either pay for or come and do uh, a monthly spraying. And Phil Plate, who does the Bad Astronomy blog, he published that. He says, this is my favorite astronomy story because it said, you know, help needed to fight invaders of the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was true. <laughs> Even the structure of the galaxy that we all take for granted, the spiraling set of arms, wasn't a simple thing to render accurately. And then I worked with Leo on his uh, data in trying to discern the spiral structure. Uh, not easy to do, especially because there's this large zone where we can't see anything, uh, and we just have to kind of imagine what the, uh, what the structure might be like there. But there's one plant and one leaf. And that's where John had to take a break from the floral representations and use something else to get his point across. And if you look closely enough at the leaf, you see there's actually some earrings in the leaf, little jewels. The gold ball here is the location of the sun. That's Sirius, which is so close that I had to put the two earrings just butted up right against one another because remember, the scale is 83 light years per inch which means that nearly all the stars that you can see with the naked eye are on the same leaf or on adjacent leaves. Deneb, which is generally considered the most distant naked eye star, is about a foot away. Which means when you look out into space and you think you're looking into the universe, you're looking at about that much of the galaxy garden. Whew, talk about wonder. Only a foot in a hundred foot wide garden. Man. And this is what gives what I call an aha moment to people ranging from third graders to astronomer, professional astronomers because you can see five orders of magnitude just with your own senses. You look and you, you see, well, there's, there's Vega and there's Aldebaran and, and Canopus, the Pleiades five inches away, ooh boy, you know. Uh, <laughs> And then you look at the rest of the garden stretching out, and it gives a sense of perspective that I don't know anything else does in terms of the galaxy. And the thing is, the third graders even, they get it. They get it, and it's going to be part of their perspective for the rest of their life. 
And, of course, if you want to get really mind-bending. Uh, there's a SETI exercise I like to do, not just with kids, but with all the visitors. I say, who thinks that in the garden we're the only leaf that has a little metal ball in it? And, of course, nobody thinks that. And I say, okay, I've put one in another leaf in the garden. Find it. <laughs> Which, which I found is an effective way of uh, countering the leap that people make that, well, if there's life everywhere, then those flying saucers are probably real, right? Uh, to me, the Fermi paradox has never really seemed a paradox because there's so many places to explore. In fact, uh, we calculated that there are a few million of these dots in the galaxy garden, but that's not nearly enough for the stars. So instead of thinking of each dot representing one star, think of each dot representing 100,000 stars. After finishing the garden, John made a fascinating discovery, too, when he thought, well, at this scale, how big is the universe? And it turns out that factor of two, it's about the size of the Earth. Getting a sense of the size of the universe is almost by definition one of those things that's impossible to conceive. But once you're standing in the Galaxy Garden and you can kind of visualize the distance to the airport and, and to Maui, it's the only time I've gotten a kind of handle on how big the universe uh, might actually be. So through some plants and a fountain and a little planning, John is able to give our minds purchase on imagining the size of the universe. Humble tools, profound insight. The other thing we should remember is how flexible and modifiable our imaginative capacity is. A person living in the Middle Ages, even a well-educated one, would not have been able to conceive of a world the size of our world, let alone a universe on the scale we're talking about. New information and the kind of cultural background radiation we all soak up from birth to death all augment imagination and have caused it to evolve. The source of John's kind of imaginative insight depends upon years of scientific study by hundreds and hundreds of men and women to build an accurate model of the structure of the galaxy. But as John himself noted, The sources of information don't necessarily have to be the most accurate. In other words, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom novels probably did as much to get people interested in becoming real Mars scientists and spacecraft engineers, even though a lot of it was wrong and ridiculous. If it inspires people, especially young people, then I think that that's one really important function that science fiction has always served and will continue to serve. This is one level of the study of imagination that we look at in particular the role of speculative culture in shaping our imaginative capacities. The plays of Herbert Seguenza often have a kind of science fictional element to them. A couple of years ago, I did an adaptation of Henry IV, part one, mm -hmm. Shakespeare. Uh, I called it El Henry, <laughs> and it was a post-Gringo, uh, California, set in the future, apocalyptic, mm -hmm. where... Uh, where the narcos in Mexico have taken over basically the United States. The United States has abandoned, you know, they've gone, you know, the Anglo population has gone east of the Rockies and has left us uh, <laughs> the Southwest back again. <laughs> bueno, if I'm not wrong, you must be El Henry. You make it sound like I would deny it. I am El Bravo of Barrio Hotspur. I am El Henry, the Prince of East Chief. And uh, it is just a apocalyptic vision of, of, of the future, and, which I don't think is too far off, yeah. actually. You know, I think... Uh... The same way a garden can alter our imaginative capacities, plays like Herbert's shape our cultural sensibilities. His satirical speculations on 2045, just like Edgar Rice Burroughs' speculations on a trip to Mars, can change our sense of present possibilities. This year, Herbert gave us a timely new play. I'm opening the 40, 41st season of uh, San Diego Rep with a play called Manifest Destinitis, and I'm really, really excited about it. It's a, an adapt, I've been really successful doing adaptations. And then my, new, my new play also talks about this whole notion of, of um, re, La Reconquista, or the reconquest, where, you know, um, 
these lands were brown, these were Indian lands, these were Mexican lands. And, you know, just through mass, just by mass demographics, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to reclaim California in the mm-hmm. Southwest just with sheer numbers of people, you know, mm-hmm. in a sense. You know, it'll, it, it'll you know, what, I mean, in a hundred years, imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, Except the, when President Trump's grandchildren <laughs> are president. Well, right? that's I, exactly. <laughs> and that's what this is all about. That's what Trump, he's, yeah. it's a that's reaction, a reaction yeah. to... To the, to the changing the demographics, paranoia, you know, yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. and in fact, in this new play, I, you know, the I I put, you know, the Trump's famous uh, Mexican speech. <laughs> I give it to a Californio <laughs> saying, you know, t- uh, worried about the the impending Yankee yes. invasion from the east, you know, and this is, you know, we got to. Manifest Destiny is set in uh, 1848, mm-hmm. and between 1848 and 1850. This this land that we're on right now, California, became a state. You know, I mean, it's right. talk about major, major, uh, upheaval, you know, yeah. upheaval mm-hmm. and cultural culture clash. You know, mm-hmm. in in three years, you know, people and bypassing a huge chunk of the country yeah, just to get to California. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. and you know, and 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 the Treaty of Guadalupe was a, was a was a treaty that was basically broken right away. It, you know, it, it, it said that Mexicans had the rights and they could uh, keep owning their land and, and all these things. And, and that didn't happen, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, little by little, that 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 treaty got eroded. And uh, and now, you know, the, and now we're the, the legal aliens. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like to show people that, you know, history... History is always in my plays, mm-hmm. you know. You know, we're we're here because this happened not mm-hmm. too long ago, right? You know? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you know, only 175 years ago, this was Mexico. So of course, there's Mexicans, you know. Right. Of course, there's a lot right. of people, you know. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, there's Mexicans more uh, longer heritage. <laughs> you know, of than course, there is. You know, right, that's right. So you know, it, people, but people tend to forget that, and the Trumps are trying to say, no, we've always been here, and it's no, it's not, it's not true. No, no. So this so is this a is uh, yeah. I based it off a, uh, a Moliere play called the, the Imaginary Invalid, which has no politics in it whatsoever. It's a French farce about a, a hypochondriac. But I I made my uh, main character have a disease called manifest destinitis, <laughs> and it's a disease about it's a it's a fear of the unknown of the of the foreigner. And that, is that another? That's another one man performance. No, no, oh, no. This, this is, is a, a full cast ensemble. of a, okay. yeah. I have a eight fantastic. eight actors in a in a kid. Mm-hmm. Who who gives us the news every ten minutes? He <laughs> comes updating the you know, you know the Americans have yeah. won the war. The Americans have you know signed the Treaty of Guadalupe. The yeah. Americans are you know the gold rush. Because <laughs> imagine in 1948 yeah. the the Mexican American War ended. 1949 gold was discovered. That's right. That that was huge. That was a huge. And in, 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 in 1850 it was a state. So that's like major Incredible. major events happening. Yeah, just just world mm-hmm. reverberating mm-hmm. the world. Though we're fascinated by the ways in which AI and machine learning can be harnessed to shape our imaginations, and for good reason, now more than ever, it's important to be reminded, culture leads the way. It shapes what seems possible or impossible, right or wrong, just or unjust. And we all shape the culture, scientist and artist alike. I think we've gotten out of whack a little bit. Like the yeah, arts are, are, are kind of not supported as much. And I'm a scientist saying this. Is it as challenging? I mean, it's challenging in the sciences to get funding, but it's I imagine it's very challenging. Oh, it's in the very arts. challenging yeah. in the arts. And, and I think, yeah, both science and arts are underappreciated, you know, mm-hmm. in, 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 you know, the, the, the public do, don't, you know, don't, don't appreciate it, don't understand it. And so, the, yeah, that goes along with the funding, yeah, I guess, you know. Yeah, I always feel like we have this huge, you know. And I mean, I, we understand real estate, so, you know, you have, <laughs> yeah. you know, Panda Expresses, you know, we, we understand food, we understand real estate, money, and you see all that uh, all right. getting funded easily. But yeah. when it comes to arts and sciences, you don't, no. you know, you know. And it's really, that's, that's. I mean, uh, Ken Burns was a speaker at my graduation uh, way back when, and, and he said, you know, it's great to have, you know, engineering and the disciplines of, you know, for defense and protection and things like that. But what are the things you're trying to protect? Yeah. You want to protect the culture, a culture, you know, and, and some say, you know, science, the highest form of pure science, not applied science, not building the next iPhone or, you know, Qualcomm chip. Yeah. Like what are we fighting for? Exactly. You know, if, what if are we trying to protect? Yeah. You know, if not the arts and the science. Right. Many thanks to our guests, Herbert Seguenza and John Lomberg. Into the Impossible is a podcast of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. 
The podcast is made possible with support from the Clark Center's patrons and sponsors, including Viasat Inc. and the James B. Axe Family Foundation. Audio production is by Wes Hawkins and Patrick Coleman. Produced by Patrick Coleman and Sheldon Brown. Find out more about the Clark Center at imagination.ucsd.edu. And thank you for listening. If you like the show, please leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe. Uh, The next episode is going to be something really, really special. And you won't want to miss it. Thanks. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three.